Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another podcast. On today's show, I have the CEO and founder of Client Command, Jonathan Lucene, and we have an active discussion planned regarding our recently published PCG Research Report on their platform. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Good to be here. Jonathan, for people who don't know who Client Command is, could you give us a little thumbnail? How many years you've been in business? How many dealers do you serve today? Yeah, absolutely. So I founded the business in 1999, and we were a big data predictive analytics business until 2014 when we launched the Active Shopper Network, and the company took off at that point. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that. Great. Now, Jonathan, you mentioned you come from a big data background, and of course, conferences like the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit talk about anonymous shopper data. Uh, Companies like LiveRamp or Experian or others, which seem to have a lot of information on consumers. Before we dive into your product, do you find that dealers are a little confused about really what it means to have anonymous shopper data? Yeah, Brian, I think sometimes it is confusing. You you do have companies in the industry that will uh, help you de-anonymize. Customers from your website, that's identity resolution is becoming a real product uh, around the world. And people are trying to figure out what does that mean? What do I actually have and what can I actually see? I believe we're the only company that can do it with Conquest customers, true Conquest across the entire entire web. But that is, is something that's a bit confusing to dealers, even the difference from one to the other. Yeah, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a big buzz with Datium, right? So Datium was kind of the first in automotive to talk about using anonymous shopper data, uh, marketing to people who visit their website. From my estimations, on average, 1%, maybe 2% of total shoppers to a dealer's website fill out a lead form. Uh, Maybe 3 or 4% will call. Over 90% of the shoppers to a dealer's website are anonymous, and that that frustrates my clients. They're like, how come we can't get more information on who's visiting, and are they even our existing customers? So, Jonathan, with this anonymous data, with big data behind your company, at a very high level, isn't it allowing you to have very precise marketing strategies instead of local spray and pray? Yes, absolutely. When you combine the offline and the online data, like Client Command does, and you're able to identify everybody in the market area that's actually looking for a vehicle today so that you can market to those people, whether they're on your website or not on your website, it's irrelevant. You're able to market to them. And not only are you able to market to them, but you're able to market to them in the way that they want to be marketed to. So you know what their dominant buying motive is, you know exactly what car they're looking for and what they're considering. So the ability to personalize marketing is greater than it's ever been. And I see that, Jonathan, as we hear more phrases like one-to-one marketing instead of, you know, mass media marketing. When you built this new platform, You came up with a great acronym. I I like this, the Active Shopper Network. And it really is the core piece to helping dealers understand how to use all these data sources for their business. For a dealer who's not familiar with the Active Shopper Network, how would you describe it? I think the best way to describe it, Brian, is to start with what most of the in-market shopper data is in our industry and then differentiate from there. Most of the active shopper data in our industry that we can buy is 45 to 90 days old. It's somebody that filled out a form or raised their hand at some point and said, I'm in the market to buy something, talk to me about it. The challenge with that is according to Deloitte in their study in 2018, 69% of consumers buy a car 
in less than 90 days. So if the data is 45 to 90 days old, you lose unless you're the first guy to them. And what the <laughs> Active Shopper Network is, go ahead. No, and, and uh, Jonathan, just as a, a, a comment on that, I know oftentimes these cross-sell or pump-in, pump-out reports are 90 days old. What is a dealer supposed to do with 90-day-old data you know, to help change their marketing outcomes? Yeah, that, then precisely, Brian. That's exactly the problem. So we created the Active Shopper Network to identify someone the moment they start shopping for a vehicle wherever they're shopping for a vehicle across the internet, figure out why are they buying that vehicle? Is it safety? Did they get a promotion? Are they just replacing an old car? What, what's happening in many cases, we'll see somebody that uh, is all of a sudden searching safety and body shop work at the same time. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? So the Active Shopper Network identifies these people that are shopping for cars and why they're shopping for them. And then our technology launches marketing one-to-one -to, -one to those individuals. So how big is this network? It sounds uh, impressive, but are we talking about a small subset of the shoppers, all of the shoppers, or how would you describe the, the breadth and the width of this active shopper network? So we cover 91% of the internet connected devices in the United States. And by cover them, I mean, we see them at least once a month. The Active Shopper Network, when you published your report a few months ago, was two and a half million people actively shopping. And those are individuals, each of them has about three devices. It is now 7.9 million people actively shopping for vehicles. And is that a seasonal thing, Jonathan, that um, different times of the year, there's more people in market than others? No, it's an AI-driven growth. Great. But what we're seeing is we're getting data from 31 billion web pages every day. And what our AI does is it goes and crawls the web page or URL, if it doesn't know it, to identify what the, what the consumer is looking at and heat map that and learn from that so that it identifies then who's going to buy a car or who has bought a car, what did they do in the past, and how does that be, help you predict who's going to buy a car tomorrow and what shopping behavior actually looks like. And as, as that improves, we're able to grow the active shopping network. There is a point where we're pretty close to a saturation point where there really aren't many more than 7.9 million people looking for cars right now. The, there are a lot more devices, and if you expand the time frame, sure, you can get up to 40, 50 million unique identifiers through cookies and things of that nature. But it's, it's pretty much everybody that's looking for a car in the U.S. right now. And in the research report, we show how you drill down. So for a dealer who's, let's just say, in the Cincinnati market, they can drill down right into their PMA and see how many shoppers, active shoppers, are in their market. How does that help a dealer understand opportunities? Yeah, so if your market, if you have more shoppers in your market, it may be a time to get a little bit more robust and spend a little bit more in marketing. And when that begins to go down, would be your, that would be your leading indicator that it's time to pull back a little bit on your marketing spend and get real good at your processes as opposed to waiting for sales to decline. You can get about a 30-day head start if you start looking at active shopper data. Great. And then based on the active shopper data and the region that the dealer wants to target, let's talk about these active shopper cards. As, as a dealer hones in, I'm looking for truck buyers in my market, Okay. How, what's the next step? Explain the active shopper cards. Yeah, so <clears throat> once we get to the point that we, have the, we have permissible purpose from the customer to actually share their information with the dealer, and I think you and I should talk about privacy some. I'm sure that's on your list of things. Once the dealer has the right to see that data and the customer has uh, consented to the dealer's privacy policy, 
or another privacy policy that allows us to share it, we will tell the dealer, John Smith is looking for an F-150. He's comparing it with the Silverado and the Dodge Ram. He's been in the market X number of days. And uh, right up to dominant buying motive, uh, the dealer can see that information in his active shopper portal with client command. And then he can pick up the phone and call. We, have, we do have scripts that train uh, people to call the customer and then have a, a relevant conversation around that. So in addition to calling, Jonathan, when, when a dealer sets their marketing area and what type of products they want to market and you identify people who match, you mentioned that um, the platform will decode who those people are, provide a phone number if possible. How about email or physical address so a dealer could drop uh, postcards or a personalized letter, maybe just announcing about a special sale that's going on uh, without being too creepy? Yeah, so we will immediately put them uh, on the, the list of people that we are targeting. So we're emailing on behalf of the dealer at that point rather than giving the email address directly to a salesperson who might send them emails that aren't can spam compliant. Got now, it. if that, if that uh, customer is in the dealer's DMS or CRM, of course, we'll pass through the email at that point because the dealer already has a, a different type of permissioning with that consumer. Great. So let's, you mentioned privacy. So let's talk about this for a minute. What we're talking about in the active shopper network and these, active shopper cards is through big data, through partnerships with permission-based access to consumer data, we can start to decode, this is Brian Pash's phone and this is Brian Pash's home computer. So when that consumer comes to the dealer's website and looks at a Ford F-150, even though the consumer doesn't submit a lead form, the dealer, if the matching uh, is correct, could be provided that Brian Pash was on your site looking at a Ford F-150. Is that a high level uh, description of, of the benefits of looking at not just the people who submit leads, but the people who visit the dealer's website? Yeah, I think that's accurate uh, at a high level. It's, it's very important to keep the consumer's anonymous bribing, browsing history anonymous and private. Uh, so we, we filter greatly what we share with dealers so that the dealer's always in a position with the consumer where the conversation they're having doesn't get to that creepy stage. So, so give, yeah, the give us an is, example, Jonathan. Like, so there's a number of products coming to market. I think one of them is called Four Eyes, and there's a few others that – will tell dealers who visited their website. And I never got a clear answer from some of these companies about the, the privacy. So let's talk about your platform specifically. When do you decide that you can permissibly share the consumer's data who has effectively been anonymous? What's that trigger? How would a dealer understand that or explain that? It's a great question, Brian. Uh the difference in a consumer that you can legally share information with and those that you can't right now exists primarily based on the consumer's consent to the privacy policy at the bottom of each page or URL that that consumer visits. So if the privacy policy states that that information can be shared, then it can be. Their, their browsing history can be shared uh, as as is relevant to what they're doing on that page. And so, Jonathan, question. Um, some websites, the first time you visit them, pop up something that says, hey, you consent to our privacy policy. And I've seen, obviously, in Europe with the GDPR, that's a huge thing. Um, I don't see that much in the U.S. So based on current law, and I know you're not a lawyer, but if a dealer who's listening to this is super excited, but then afraid about privacy, does a consumer have to physically uh, opt into a question? Or if the privacy policy states 
hey, by visiting this website, we will be using your browsing history and, and cookie data uh, for marketing. What, what's, what's it like today in the U.S.? Yeah, so you're correct. I'm not a lawyer. Our recommendation is that the consumer does physically opt in to their browsing history being used. However, as I understand the law today, that's not actually required in the U.S. It is in Europe with GDPR. We've designed our platform so that it's completely uh, anonymous data is completely separate from what we call PII or known data where you have the personally identifiable information and they remain separate uh, with the encrypted links once the, the privacy policy has been accepted. Great. So let's step back. Um, dealers have been spending a lot of money on digital marketing. They know that there's some waste in that spend because they're buying keywords, they're guessing intent based on a single keyword. What I'm hearing, Jonathan, is one of the ways in which Client Command eliminates waste is that you're not basing a marketing decision off a single keyword, but you're looking at their shopping behavior and intensity. And to me, that makes so much sense, especially when you look at the engagement rates on a dealer's website when they buy certain words and ad words. How would you describe it to dealers how your system is smarter at discovering consumer intent? So, Brian, we have 224 million shoppers over 18 years of age in the U.S. that we track and we score their intensity every day, whether or not that, that consumer is actually involved in shopping or maybe they just Googled to find out how fast the car was or how fast it would go from zero to 60. That's very different than a consumer that's actively shopping for a Mustang or a Corvette or some other vehicle. So their intensity score goes up with each one of their activities or down with each activity, which allows you to target your marketing precisely. And man, with the market we're coming into, the competitive advantage for dealers will be able, will be spending less money to actually talk to the real shoppers. As everybody pulls back, uh, our dealers can actually amplify their voice in the ears of the real shoppers. And that's music to a dealer's ear because, you know, we, we always use those terms like, oh, that person was just a tire kicker. You know, today, if somebody walks on a dealer's lot, they are a buyer because the internet provides them with so much information. They don't have to, you know, drive over to a dealership in the same way dealers have been asking me, Brian, there got to be a better way to market. I'm, I'm buying keywords. I'm doing retargeting. It feels like I'm wasting a lot of money. And, and what I've looked at this year, and I've educated dealers on my tour that it's not uncommon for 50 to 70% of all AdWords clicks other, to, other than the homepage to do nothing. Like they do not visit another page, meaning the ability to identify an active shopper based on a single keyword, you're guessing wrong two or three uh, out of four times wrong. It seems like to me, that we're finally seeing the benefits to dealers of big data because they can really make sure their ad dollars is talking to the right person. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Brian. One of the, the jokes we have around here is big data, so what? And so what is, so what do you do with it? it, it great that you have a lot of data, great that uh, your data engine is fantastic and robust. What, what do you actually do with it and why does it matter to a dealer? It only matters if you can target advertising more efficiently and effectively and drive more sales. So let's paint a picture, a simplified picture, but I like going back because sometimes dealers get lost in this conversation. So you have visibility on active automotive shoppers where they're living. So which of these active shoppers are in the dealer's primary market area? You have the ability to see their intensity and then market to them with an appropriate offer. In the research report, we've spent a lot of time talking about matched sales. So how do you describe the influence that Client Command Advertising has on a showroom visit or a sale? 
Yeah, I think that you've written some good stuff about the attribution fallacies that are out there in the industry today. It is important that that we go drive all the way down to the individual consumer and how many ads were they served and what ads were they served. And with today's technology, we can do that. There are a number of companies that can help you with attribution. For client command, we're really concerned with when did we get to the customer? How many days did we stay with the customer? How many times did we interact with the customer? And how did they engage with those interactions before they bought? And so we tell a dealer that on every single sale that matches back to any of, of his advertising. So Jonathan, this, this sounds almost too good to be true, meaning if you have a match, you're not taking 100% credit. You're saying, hey, for these, we had two interactions. Hey, for this group, we had 10. For this, we had 20. So a dealer can see that, well, if you only had two, obviously some other media or other influences got them to come into the dealership, but but you're not taking blind credit treat, treating every sale the same. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think you're you're hearing that correctly. Uh, I'll say there are some consumers that will you'll market to them and they will come in that day. Now, whether that was client command marketing or somebody else's marketing that got there first depends on the consumer. Right. The there are some consumers that we may market to for 120 days. We may have 50 different impressions and engagements with that consumer. It would be crazy for client command to think that nobody else advertised to that consumer in 120 something days. Mm -hmm. Right. At some point, they probably saw an ad on TV or something, right? Right. So we give the dealer the data and we think dealers are really smart people and they can make an educated decision if you give them the data. And I agree. I agree. So what I'm hearing is really an answer to an age long problem that dealers have had as they've embraced digital is, hey, I don't want to waste my money too high in the funnel. I don't want to miss local low funnel shoppers. How do you get them the message that this dealer has a great product. When we talk about marketing to the consumer, are you using responsive email templates? Are you doing AdWords? Are you doing Facebook? Are you doing texting? How are you getting in front of that in-market shopper if a dealer signs up for Client Command? Yes to responsive emails. Yes to social, uh, Facebook, Instagram, We'll use some mail when the, the consumer actually profiles as a mail responder. We have a BDC that will call the consumer when they're higher in the funnel. When they're lower, we will put them in the dealer's CRM or their active shopper portal if they have the proper permissioning. And the dealer can actually call that consumer. We do not want to be in the AdWords battle. That is a... Um, that's a tough place right now. It's effective and, and dealers should do it to some degree. It, it's not the place where uh, we see the best returns, especially with the OEMs pushing dealers to advertise against each other and the third parties also advertising in, in the same space using the dealer's inventory. It, it gets challenging. So, for example, if a dealer was using lot links for AdWords advertising, there would be no conflict for them also to use client command for all of the other channels. That's correct. Yeah, that, that's correct. Great. So let's dive into a funny conversation I had the other day at dinner. I was with a dealer principal and he said, hey, Brian, you know, all this anonymous shopper data, it's kind of confusing to me. I don't know what to make of it. And he was going on and I was like, OK, he, he's seriously asking a question. He said, hey, what do you think about client command? And I said, well, we just recently were hired to write a research report. And that sponsored research is right online, pcgresearch.com. I have a number of great clients that are very pleased with it. So I think they're doing a great thing. And he goes, oh, I'm just busting you. Uh, I'm using those guys for three months. It's awesome. There's guys in my 20 group that are using it. They love it. And here's what he said, especially for conquesting. Now, this is kind of music to dealers' ears because conquesting in Google AdWords is super expensive and primarily, I've seen, inefficient. 
How do you approach conquesting as a new modern strategy with a strong return on investment? I love the story, Brian. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. The, the reason conquesting has always been such a challenge is the most difficult thing to do is identify somebody that's in the market. And then the next most difficult thing to do is get that person that's never been to your store or your website to actually visit you. Our active shopper network takes all the hassle out of and inefficiency out of identifying who's actually in the market. And then our automated marketing takes the hassle out of getting them to visit your website or come to your dealership. So it does change that equation. It's still harder to get a Conquest customer to buy a vehicle from you than it is to get a retained customer, which I think we all know it's common sense, right? And one of the, the competitive advantages that Client Command enjoys is we are the only company using data the way we're using it to actually identify and connect with Conquest shoppers. So Jonathan, uh, tactically now for dealers listening and saying, okay, I get the anonymous shopper data. I understand privacy compliant. I'd love to be able to market to all the active shoppers in my PMA. Um, I like the idea of conquesting. How much control do I have? So if a dealer is a, say a Toyota dealer and they want to conquest Hyundai or Kia, do they tell you which models and brands or does the system figure out that for them? So this gets to a, a, a different question that I would, um, I would pose. Do customers buy what we want to sell them or do they buy what they want to buy? And my answer would be both. So we may want to conquest Hyundai shoppers and the system will work on that. We can point it towards that and client command will go, go after that. But if it's really Honda customers that you have a better chance to conquest that are more responsive and that are looking for cars that are more competitive with what you have on your lot, the system will identify that and allow for the switch. So at the end of the day, we've got a certain inventory we have to sell as a, as a dealer and the consumer has certain needs that they have to fill with the car they get. And what Client Commands AI does is matches the two up. Well, that makes, that makes sense. Sometimes pitched conquest battles are emotional, not uh, based on data. And I like the fact that if a dealer said, look, I need to move these Mazda CX-5s. I, I got a lot of them on my lot. Hey, client command, uh, let's see if we can conquest other brands that may be a good fit. They don't have to guess, right? Uh, the AI will say, okay, Based on what we've seen in your market, in the Active Shopper Network, these are some people who looked at Toyotas, but also looked at Mazdas and also looked at Fords in the compact SUV segment, and uh, we're going to go after them. Is that, is, is that the right story? Yeah, you're spot on, Brian. I like the way you said it better, really, even than the way I said it. And the other thing we see in that regard is we will often see customers that have bought multiple vehicles from a dealership start searching or uh, exploring competitive makes. And at that point, it's a great opportunity to launch marketing to retain those individuals so that you, you eliminate that defection before it ever happens. That, that's a great point because we all know, uh, and we've heard from research, the cost to acquire a customer versus the cost to keep a customer, right? So the acquisition cost is super high. If you do the right thing to your you know, existing client base, you increase retention, but there's always people out shopping that the dealer doesn't know are in market, right? I remember a number of years ago, Vin Lenz, uh, they were the first people that kind of in the automotive talked about, hey, know if your existing customers are shopping on your website. And I thought that was so cool, especially for retention. So the Active Shopper Network is great for efficient marketing, great for conquest, but it's also an effective way to protect your market share and your customer base. Isn't that fair? Couldn't have said it better. Yes. So Jonathan, in the research report, we have a number of dealers that have very positive things to say. And obviously that type of research means that we've talked to a lot of people and people really believe in this product. So if a dealer or a dealership manager is listening to today's podcast and you had to say one thing that would motivate them to pick up the phone and call you, 
especially as we look to the new year and selling cars in a more challenging economic environment, what, what message do you want to punch home as we close our interview today? I would just say, if you want to be the first person to know when somebody goes in market and you want your message in front of them before all of your competitors, weeks before your competitors, then client command is at least worth a look. You should see what we're doing, because if you're not using us, your competitor probably is. And I think that that is a clear challenge. Every dealer I know wants to make sure that their brand is top of mind when a consumer goes in market. So having first market mover advantage is critical. And then what I've been telling dealers, hey, if you are able to keep your brand top of mind with active shoppers, if they type in your name, Google, 100% of the time, will show your dealership website, number one in organic, the Google My Business shows, meaning Google gets them to your website for free if, if they type in your name. And it seems like to me that client command is really efficient because you're working on getting that dealership's top of mind awareness to the right people and let Google get them to their website for free if they don't click on an ad. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's accurate. We see both uh, organic traffic going up as well as engagement through the ads. So Jonathan, thank you so much for engaging with PCG to conduct this research. Again, the research report can be downloaded at pcgresearch.com. Now your website is simply clientcommand.com. But Jonathan, if a dealer principal or marketing manager wanted to speak with you, what's the best number to reach you at? My mobile number is 404-593-3677. Great. Well, Jonathan, I want to thank you for your time. I'm excited. I know some of the most demanding dealers in the United States who've tried dozens of solutions and have been disappointed. You have some raving fans out there. I hope this podcast will attract some other dealers who are looking to really ratchet down their marketing costs and increase the output from those marketing dollars because I think Client Command should be part of their online marketing strategy. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time, and we wish you the best of success in the coming days. Thanks, Brian. It's been great to be with you. And obviously, we'd love to talk to any of your listeners. Good luck to you and PCG. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan.